Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Wednesday, April the 11th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Your second daily dose of happy for the day. And uh, Wendy, early this morning, Cindy and I decided that today was not just Wednesday, that it's Wednesday in honor of A.A. Milne and uh, his description that Wednesday, the Windy Wednesday, is the actual name for the day of the week. So we figured that's kind of whimsical. We'll go with that. Well, that works for me because I come from the Windy City. There you go. And my name begins with W, so that's I right. like, you know, sometimes I'm Windy Wendy. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. That works well. So how are you doing? Things going well? Yeah, it's going great. You know, being off of work for today's day number five because I include the weekend, I have to say I feel alive and creative and like I'm in my element and oh it's just a joyful joyful feeling I love it how about you pretty good day yeah I mean I I actually added to my mirror work this morning not intentionally not intentionally I found something new um over the last uh, 24 hours or so, there were a couple of things that happened that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I was having a hard time with them. And I woke up this morning. I, and you know how uh, Abraham teaches that when you first wake up, that's your best chance to reach for that high vibration point. Well, I, I wasn't getting there. <laughs> Just not getting there. I had this, this level of resistance that was in the way. I said, well, shoot, I got to get rid of this. How do I get rid of this? So I get up, do my usual thing, and then go to do the mirror work. And I was finding that the mirror work was doing wonders in terms of helping me to release it. I was actually feeling movement inside of me while I was doing it. So what normally is like a 30 to 45 second routine went on for like three or four minutes and it felt good. And I got done with that and I said, whoa, that's pretty cool. So now I have a tool to use if I get into a bad place and I really need to rock it up the scale quickly, right? Well, now I have a way to do it. Apparently, just from doing it over and over again for a number of days, I'm now like acclimated to it or something. So it just kind of gets me there quickly. I love that. Wow. And, And, you know, just to kind of touch on that subject of of what Abraham talks about, because it's something that I use like most every day, since we release resistance during our sleep time then when we wake up in the morning that's when we are at our highest vibration because we are without resistance but what's so interesting based on what you said it sounds as though and this is so easy to do like as soon as you were really aware that you were awake you started thinking about the things from yesterday that didn't feel so good oh almost instantly yeah and and what I wanted to comment on is if you're not aware that that's what you're doing, like if you don't know that you're actually you've actually released resistance during the night and you're at your highest place in the morning, right. it's like sometimes we're just so unaware that we have actually like immediately uh, dropped back into yesterday's vibration by pulling those thoughts into today, because. I, you know, like I remember the first time I heard Abraham say, you're at your highest vibration early in the morning because you have no resistance. And I was willing to argue that point because I'm like, no, that's not true for me. You know, and I had <laughs> yeah. all these examples of all these days that like, no, as soon as I woke up, I felt bad because blah, 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 blah. Was, yeah, I've done that well, too. When I, you know, I heard Abraham say it over and over and I'm like, you know, they've never really lied before. So maybe I ought to give this some credit and figure out what on earth is going on. Because if I think that it's not true for me, then what is it I'm doing that I'm not aware of? And Mm. I started to pay attention and I realized like so subtly when I had a negative thing going on, oh my God, I brought it back into the next day. Like before I even knew I was awake, I was already thinking about, oh, that jerk at work, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm like, no, that's me doing it. Yeah. That's me doing it. So now I really take the time to in the morning to like the moment I notice I'm awake, I kind of uh, acknowledge I'm in the best, highest place I can be right now. Do What, what do I want to do with it? And I'm deliberate about what I want to do with it. And it, yeah, if I want to think about something ugly from yesterday, uh, that's my business and I can do it. But when I do it, I don't just go, uh, well, I have no choice or I, I don't know what I'm doing because now I do know what I'm doing. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. Yeah. But that that was the thing. Even though I knew that was my opportunity, 
I couldn't get there. I mean, I was really reaching for it. I, I, I knew that I was instantly reacting. I could tell that was going on. But I was trying to stop, and I was trying to focus, and I was trying to find that really happy thought. And, and actually, you know what did the most for me? It didn't get me there, but what did the most for me is that I, I actively said something like, I can't get there. I need help getting there. And at that instant, my cat jumped up on the bed and walked up to get petted. I figured, well, yeah, Aww. that's a good idea. <laughs> You know, because it's hard to feel bad when you're petting a cat, right? So I tried that. That helped some, but I wasn't really getting there. That That's what was really bugging me. I couldn't get there. Well, and that's so cool that you now have a new practice in your life. Yeah. That oh, yeah. helps push you through things and helps you get to a great place. I mean, it's kind of like Abraham lately, I'd say like for the last year, has just so been talking about the benefits of meditation. And... I will tell you this, they're not recommending meditation because that is the only way to get to the result that you're the, you're seeking. They just think it's one of the easiest ways, which is why they really, really love the idea of meditation. Hmm, okay. But the idea that they're uh, a proponent of is letting go of resistance. So I like to say if, if meditation's not your thing, that's okay. Just find some kind of practice in your life where you can let go of resistance. And it sounds like your mirror work seems to do that for you. Yeah, it, so. it, it, well, it's, it's this funny thing. It, it does do it, and it does it quickly. And I didn't understand what was going on, but I loved it. I loved how it felt. And I, and I, I, could, I could feel that, – that's what the part I didn't understand. I couldn't understand why it was. I was feeling something that I, that I normally didn't feel. I was feeling like I, – I figured it was the resistance shifting around and getting ready to, to exit me or something like that because it was like this, this movement inside me. And that was a new thing. That, that's why I was confused by it. It was, a, it was a new experience to have that direct of a visceral experience. Mm. I wasn't used to that. Now, I did try, I did think of something else too, because after I was done with the mirror work for the day, uh, the next thing was to go get the computer started up and, you know, get things fired up because I had the morning podcast with Cindy. And mm -hmm. I started to go through that and I said, oh, that's right. I was going to do segment intending. And so I had to do my, my intending for that upcoming segment, which was going to be pretty easy. And as soon as I thought that, a really interesting idea came to my mind. I said, what if I combine segment intending with mirror work? What if I give my intention to myself looking in the mirror? And when I thought of that, I said, whoa, that feels pretty good. And I was remembering what you told me the other day about, you know, because I was talking about how I, I, I often have trouble differentiating. If, is it my own physical idea or is it an idea from my inner or infinite being? And you suggested, well, you know, go with it if it's a really good feeling idea. Well, that one felt really good. So I said, okay, let's give it a shot. And I, I started doing it today so that throughout the day, anytime I started doing my next thing, I got in front of the mirror to do my next segment. And I can't report any big results from that yet, but I thought I kept going with the mirror work just to see what would happen, and I got this big new result there. Maybe if I combine the two uh, modalities together, maybe I'll find some other new result. You know, I'm totally on board with what you said because obviously that's why I said it to you. When you're, when you're learning how to differentiate between your own voice and the voice of your mother or the voice of, you know, your infinite being, to me, I say if it feels good, it kind of doesn't really matter the exact source of the, the message because the bottom line is when it feels good, the actual feeling good is an indicator that you are in alignment with your inner being. So whether you came up with the thought yourself or whether your inner being like r sent it to you and you received it or whether it's something that you heard, you know, somebody say a long time ago and it popped into your memory, I still believe that could be your infinite being like pulling that thought out of your memory bank and handing it to you in the moment that it would be useful. So that, that makes sense. Just following following what your feelings are telling you is really the indicator as to whether you know it's going to uh, it's something that would support you or not support you, and the exact source not nearly as important. 
So is that kind of what you were concluding this morning? As yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, not nearly as important. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter as much. That's why I was pausing there. But I, I guess you're right. It, it doesn't really matter. What matters is whether it feels good. It doesn't matter whether it came from my physical mind or from my internal being or my mother's voice or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. As long as it feels good, I guess that's really the main thing. Yeah, and the fact that you had the awareness that it felt good, yeah. that to me is the most important part of this thing that you've shared. Because that's the thing that so many people that, you know, that when I'm working with them as clients, especially in the beginning of our relationship, they don't know what they're feeling. And even though I'm trying to point out, you know, like, stop, notice what you're feeling in this moment or notice, you know, this story you told me how you felt. Um, it sometimes takes a couple sessions for them to start to go, oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, this is what I felt. Oh, this feeling is actually telling me something, you know, and I get really excited when they get, they start putting those ideas together. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 I can see that. So anyway, that's <sighs> my big breakthrough for the day. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Yeah, it is good. Um, okay. So I'm purposely stalling for a moment because my lawn people have just showed up and I, they were expected yesterday. And so I haven't put my money out under the mat for them. Oh, so go ahead. I'm well, going to put the phone you, on you, mute you, for you half a that. second because they're making all sorts of noise you, you do while that. I put the money out. Hold on. Yeah, go right ahead. And, and actually, I'm dealing with the same thing here, which is interesting because we've got uh, people mowing the lawn outside the window here. So uh, if listeners, if you hear a lawnmower, no, it's not somebody who's mowing outside your window. It's outside my window. Not a big deal. <laughs> But uh, while Wendy is coming back, I want to remind everybody a couple things. First, I haven't said this in a while, but we want to make sure that you remember to subscribe and share. Um, most of the listeners have done that. We know that because of how many people or how many episodes the average listener downloads. But for those of you who are newer listeners, if you haven't subscribed yet, by all means, do it. All the instructions are right on the homepage. Uh, really easy to do. The homepage, of course, is at LOAToday.net. And, uh, you know, we welcome you to subscribe and then share it because... Uh, the, the, the sharing is just as important as the subscribing. That's how we find more and more people who learn about us and say, hey, that's pretty good stuff. I want to have my daily dose of happy, too. Cool. All right. Well, now that my lawn guys are paid. <laughs> that's a good thing. I, I was commenting, actually, that we got lawnmowers outside of my window here, too. So we got lawn mowing going on all over the place. <laughs> well, one of the things, you know, because I talk about how now that I'm on vacation this week, I like to milk my mornings and think on specific things. This morning was a little bit unique because as I was, you know, wanting to do my thing, the phone rang and it was a dear friend of mine. And I could tell she was emotionally troubled, you know, having some kind of thing going on. And so, you know, we just kind of started chatting and she was telling me her circumstances. And first of all, she's like, I'm just so overwhelmed with all these things going on. So I said, well, what, what are the things? Because, and I wanted to purposely share this today because I thought it was a great example of paying attention to what the signs are, like how you know what is being communicated to you from sources beyond um, the veil, <laughs> from okay. non-physical. Yeah. And so anyway, I said, all right, well, first of all, the, the meaning of overwhelm is simply that you are thinking about too many things at one time, and that's why we get overwhelmed. Sure. And I know that sounds really simplistic, but it's amazing when we get overwhelmed, we forget that. Oh, yeah, I agree. We're thinking, of, thinking on too many things. So I said, let's just take each one of the things in your life that's feeling like something you can't handle, because those were her words, you know, let's just talk about them. So she talked about how, let's see, her heater, she went to turn the heater on and it wouldn't work. So she pulled something apart and, and you know, went, okay, it's just making this weird clicking sound. And then she tried to use the air conditioner thing and it didn't seem to work. And she's like, oh my God, so now there's something wrong with my, my AC and heating and whatever. And and she said, but I've called some, a repairman and, you know, he's on his way out. But what she said, but she said this to me, she goes, I know, Wendy, you've talked to me for a long time about everything 
even circumstantial things have some kind of message for me. So I've been trying to think about what these, what that meant. The fact that my heating and air conditioning unit seemed not to be working. And she said, I, all I could come up with is that I was running hot and cold, something about hot and cold. I went, okay. Didn't know what to do with that, but just kind of took that idea and put it on a mental shelf. And I said, okay, what else is going on in your life? And she said, well, in my bedroom closet, I noticed it was a weird thing. It was like there was this line of dirt on the wall. And she goes, I couldn't figure out what that was. And this was a few days ago. So she said, I just got the vacuum cleaner and I vacuumed up that dirt. Thinking, I have no idea why there would be dirt, like, on my wall in the closet. Mm, yeah. So I guess a day or two later, she looked at it and there was that line of dirt again. Now, at this point, I'm starting to get a sense of what it is. And I don't know if just by talking about it, it makes sense like anybody else is getting a clue. But I think I was tapping in energetically to what it was. So anyway, she vacuums up the line of dirt and heads off to work. And then third day, she comes back and there it is. And she looked and she looked really deep and she went, oh, there's little things moving. And she said, I think it's termites. Ooh. So she goes and starts Googling. And apparently, according to what research she did, this could be termites. So she went to, you know, the hardware store and got some termite killer kind of spray. <laughs> and she like, you know, she vacuumed them up. And then she put this little termite stuff in like the area where they were. And she said, so far, they haven't come back. It's been a couple of days. And I said, okay. But it, she was saying, oh, my God, but all this is so overwhelming. I said, okay, we're taking these one at a time. We have an AC unit. We have some weird thing on the wall that you think is termites. I said, what else is going on? Um, she talked about some money stuff. We talked about that. And I said, okay, well, um, she said, I'm just overwhelmed money-wise. I said, what does that mean? Does it mean you can't pay your bills? She goes, yeah, I, I, I don't. my bills are overwhelming. And I said, okay, does that mean you have more expenses than income? She said, yes. I said, how much more? And she goes, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? She goes, because I've been so overwhelmed, I just stack the bills and pay them as they need to be paid. And I went, okay. And she goes, but here's something really weird. She goes, it seems as though every month there's a bill that fails to get sent to me. So what does that mean? She goes, well, like this month in particular, she said, I have a list of knowing when my bills are due and my water bill is due around the 15th. And she said, I was looking through my stack of bills and I noticed I didn't have a water bill. And so she said, I walked back to my mailbox to see if there was something in there that I missed and there wasn't. And so apparently for her situation with her water bill, and I can't believe it in this day and age that there's actually a surcharge to pay online, which is why she always takes the bill, pays by check and puts it in the mail. So the ah. saves are like five bucks. But she said in this case, because the bill is due, it was worth just paying the surcharge. So I, I paid it online. But she goes, I don't understand why I d I'm not receiving the bill. And it's not always the water bill. It just each month there seems to be something that like isn't coming to me in the mail. So I went, oh, that's interesting. Again, put that on a mental shelf. So now we have an AC he heating unit, a termite situation, her bills. And I said, what else is going on? And she said, um, I, I'm just, I don't know, my relationship I'm in right now. I said, I don't know what that means. Tell me more. And she goes, I, I just don't know if I, 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 I want to have this relationship. It's a good one. He treats me really well, but I just find myself wondering if I'm going to get hurt. And so I just, I don't know. I, I, I just know that that's what's coming to the surface is that I, I just don't want to get hurt again. So my assumption is because her husband um, transitioned a couple of years ago, I made an assumption, oh, I don't want to get hurt again, meant I lost my husband. That was a hard thing to deal with. 
And if I go into a new relationship, I don't know if I really want to give my heart to a new person because he could leave too, which I think that's a real common thing that many people experience when they've been widowed. Oh, yeah. Perfectly understandable. Yeah. So now we have like these four things. I said, is there anything else? And she goes, (laughs) no, I think that's it. (laughs) Okay. And I can see how when you're, when she's thinking about all four of these at one time, of course that feels overwhelming. I said, just let's look at them one at a time. So we just kind of started talking through them each, and we started with the finances. And what was interesting is I said, okay, so what's going on with your finances? Ah, was her response. Okay, yeah. And I said, can you put some words to that for me? <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was pretty direct myself, but, you know. <laughs> I, I She's one of my very fun friends. I love her expressiveness. <laughs> and she said, I don't know. I, I, I'm just out of money and my, my debts are too high. Or not debt, but just my expenses are too, I think they're too much. They, I don't make enough money. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, how much income are you shorted each month to pay your bills? And she went, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? She said, I don't know. I'm too afraid to figure it out. And I said, are you still there? I hit a button weird on my phone. Yeah, I heard it. Don't worry about it. I'm I'm just staying really quiet okay. because that, that guy's with the leaf blower out front, so I'm trying to keep my mic muted as much as possible. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so anyway, she said, yeah, I'm really in fear to know what's happening with the money. And I said, all right, well, it's really a good thing that at least she was able to tap into the feeling and she was able to acknowledge it was fear because I said, at least now we know where we're at. And I said, you know, here's something interesting. Every time I've ever known someone to be in fear, when we find out what the real fear is about and we kind of like really tear it apart, we find out it's not so scary. I mean, have you ever experienced that, Walt? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, that's one of my favorite techniques, not only to use with myself, but if I'm trying to help somebody else, a friend or something. Uh, To me, one of the best things that you can do is play what I call the worst case scenario game. Okay, so you have this really bad thing. What's the absolute worst case scenario? What's the worst possible thing you can think of that'll happen? And when you go that route and you really get to it, you really get down to the details of it, all of a sudden it becomes a lot less powerful. Exactly. So my advice to her, as I said, okay, why don't you do this? I said, in the next couple of days, when it feels convenient, I said, put together what your expenses are, figure out, you know, how much money you make, and let's find out what the difference is. I said, then call me and we'll talk it through and we'll figure out what we need to do next. I said, but as long as it's a giant mystery, it's going to stay scary. And she admitted that. She said, yeah, you're right. And I said, remember a couple years ago when your husband transitioned, we went through this exercise then because at that time you had two incomes and so you didn't know how you were going to make it. And I said, we figured it out. And we also figured out there would probably be a point in the near future when insurance money ran out and all these other things that we'd have to reassess. And I said, I think we're there. And she went, oh, yeah. I said, and you're not alone in this. She goes, hmm. No, I'm not. And so we can't, not that we took care of that one, but it's like that one got soothed. Right. So that, and, and the reason I'm talking about it is not to like take, take all my friend's stuff and throw it out there, but I think it's useful for us to, to have real live illustrations of real live stuff that happens and figure out, well, what do you do with it and what does it mean? And so, This first situation was the fear was an indicator that, first of all, she was thinking about this the way her infinite being was not thinking about it. Yeah. And she she agreed to that. She goes, yeah, you're right, because I remember you telling me that when I think negative thoughts, my inner being doesn't think that way. And I said, well, so it might be easier, easier for us to figure out how how your inner being is thinking on this cir- circumstance of your money scenario once we know what your money scenario really is. But for right now, it's kind of clueless to us all. She went, yep, you're right. Yep. So 
we then kind of moved on to um, her relationship. And it's a new relationship. And, you know, because her husband, you know, passed a couple years ago, she's really been really quiet about telling people that she's even dating someone because, you know, she she feels that the world would frown upon her doing this, which is what, and I think it's been really wise that she's been just sharing it very sparsely with only those who really support her. Okay. But the fact that he's he's treated her really well, it's still a new relationship, maybe a couple months, but she's noticing she's kind of pulling back. And I said, well, do you know what, for what reason? She said, I just don't want to be hurt. And I said, are you afraid he's going to die? And she's like, I don't know. I, I don't want to be hurt. Well, what's interesting, and I won't go into like all every single detail, but as she was talking, I went, oh, this is not about being afraid that he's going to die like your previous husband died. I said, I think this goes back to an earlier time in your childhood. Because, oh, I know what I said to her. I go, so would you have given up the 25 years you had with your husband if you knew he was going to die? And she said, oh, no, I, I love the 25 years we spent together. And I said, I'm going to put it in strange words, but was it worth it yes. that you had the 25 years and going through, you know, the death experience with him? She was, yeah, as gruesome as that was. Yeah, it was worth the 25 years. I said, okay, so here you have the new guy. And what if you, somebody could tell you, like you're on a game show, you know, okay, behind door number one, you can have the relationship that is totally fulfilling and exciting, and he treats you well, <laughs> but that relationship will only last for five years. <laughs> <laughs> and I make up weird stuff. And I said, and behind door number two, you have no relationship for the next five years, and being a person who loves companionship, you will be alone for the next five years of your life, not knowing what the future holds after five years. Which door will you pick, door number one or door number two? <laughs> I think we can skip the box where Carol Merrill is standing. <laughs> oh, no, I was Carol Merrill. <laughs> oh, you were? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, as I was thinking it through, I was actually pointing in here, door number one, and my hands were all, you know, pointing to door number one. So she said, well, I would pick door number one. And I said, so you'd be willing to have a relationship where you felt really nurtured and you had a great companion for five years, even though he could die, you could break up, you could be divorced, whatever the circumstances that could cause you pain. She said, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. Nice. And I said, okay. And, and she said, wow, I'm really surprised I'm saying that. I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad we went down that road. I'm glad we played this yeah. game show. <laughs> so then that's when I started getting the sense, this is not about fear that she's going to lose, lose him through death. I said, I think there's something else as to how it is you're pulling back. Because then she said, well, you know, I did this with my husband too. I said, you did? She goes, oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, when we were dating, he gave me a promise ring. And then we'd have a fight or something, and I'd give it back. And then he'd give it back to me. You know, he'd take it back, and then we'd work our way back to each other because I missed him. And then we'd get reconnected, and he'd give the ring back to me. And then something would happen, and I'd give it back. And she goes, I, I didn't want to get hurt, so I just kept pulling back with him. And I said, wow, that's part of your dating history I really was unaware of. And again, this is kind of pointing pointing toward there's something deeper going on. Oh, yeah. And so it was really yeah. good that we were having this conversation. And so I just said, well, can you think of anything in your childhood, either with mom, dad, siblings, teachers, anybody you can think of, where you felt that they gave their love and took it away? And she went, well. So, you know, we talked a little bit, and I know her family history, and she goes, I kind of felt that with my mom. And I said, well, tell me what that's about. And she goes, well, there were times that, like, I, I want to get her attention, and she'd be on the phone talking to a friend. And she would just be like, mom, mom, I need to get your, you know, I need to know something from you. I just got to ask you a question. And mom would say, well, when I get off the phone, 
then, then we'll talk. And she said she would just get really upset and she'd walk away. And I said, well, how did you really feel? And she said, it made me mad because I wasn't getting my way. And I went, hmm. I said, what was your way? She goes, I wanted her to drop everything and pay attention to me. Hmm. I said, really? And then she goes, oh, my gosh, I can think of this time when I threw a temper tantrum. I mean, the kind where I was screaming and yelling on the floor. I don't know. She might have been six, seven, eight years old. And I said, what did your mom do? And she said, she went into her bedroom and ignored me. And I went, really? Now, I wasn't thinking like, oh, what a bad mom, because who knows? Maybe that was totally appropriate for the situation. It might have been, yeah, right. But I said, so you felt like you couldn't get your way. And did that feel to you like your mom stopped loving you in that moment? She goes, exactly. And I went, huh. So I said, all right. So what I mean, what I was able to surmise is I said, as a very young person, you you made a decision that when someone who's supposed to love you 24 seven, like a mom doesn't give you your way in the moment that what you decided that meant was you're not loved. And she said, Oh my God, that's it. I felt so unloved. I went, okay. So you decided that love came and went, it was hot and cold. She went, yeah, that's how I felt my relationship was with my mother all my life. It was hot and cold. And so Anyway, we kind of took a break and talked about some other things because that was getting kind of emotionally heated. Then we came back to it and I said, all right, so now let's look at this. I said, as a child, you made a child decision because you didn't have any other tools to make any other decision. And your child decision was that when mom doesn't pay attention to me in the way I want at the time I want, that she doesn't love me. And she goes, yep, that's what I decided. Yep, that's how I feel. And I said, but would you also agree that that was a decision made by a very little girl who didn't have a whole lot of information? She said, yeah. And I said, knowing your mother and knowing who she is, and now that you are an adult, if your mother knew that you would make that conclusion that she wasn't loving you, that that's how you would feel about it, do you think she would have just blown you off? Or said, no, wait till I get off off the phone. She said, no, I know my mom loves me. And I said, you're right. I said, so now as an adult, can you look at that childhood situation differently and realize you just made a childhood decision that you're still without realizing making today as an adult. And when you don't get your way, you think you're not loved and you pull back because you don't want to get hurt again. Join wow, yeah, exactly. So we kind of talked through some things and she said she was willing to open her heart toward the man in her life because she had a situation where he had called, she thought he was coming over the last week and he called, or she had called him and said, hey, where are you? And he said, oh, well, I'm heading off to such and such place and I won't see you till tomorrow. And he goes, I thought I told you that. And whether he had or not doesn't matter. But she said that was one of the places where she just went, oh, okay. And he said, what's wrong? Like he could tell that was too quick of an answer and it was very blunt. Mm -hmm. And she did her best to get off the phone with him. But what she told me today was I pulled back from him. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I I said, why? And she said, because it was too disappointing to to know that now I wasn't going to see him. Mm -hmm. And so... I, and this is information, what I'm about to say is something that was new to me, but it was just flowing as I was, you know, chatting with her. And I felt like it was my infinite being sharing this insight for her. And I said, you know, when you're discouraged and disappointed as a child, it feels devastating. But I said, as an adult, I said, haven't you ever had a situation where you're disappointed because something you looked forward to wasn't going to happen? And then you go, oh, well, so since that's not going to happen, what else can I do with my evening? And she goes, oh, sure, that happens all the time. And I said, but in this situation, because it was tied to a childhood pain, 
can you look at it differently now and realize, you know, he's going to disappoint you again. That's just the nature of relationships. And if every time he disappoints you or you feel disappointed, you go into the childhood response of now I'm not loved, that's going to make it really difficult to really make a connection with this guy. I said, could you be an adult or have adult response to disappointment and say, okay, you know what? I was looking forward to spending the evening with you, but that's, that's okay. You do your thing. I'll do my thing and we'll, we'll hook up tomorrow. And she goes, yeah, I never thought about it that way. So that in itself was just like, wow, that was cool to me that she was able to move through this stuff. But now how does this connect with the signs? Right. So she had been saying when it came to the relationship, she felt like she was hot and cold with him. And of course, that's what was connected to what happened with her mom. But now I went, hey, um, isn't that what we just talked about with your AC and heater? That it's like it goes, it's hot and cold. And she went, yeah. And I said, isn't that an interesting circumstantial metaphor for your relationship? <laughs> like there is a sign from the universe. Like why today of all days did your AC and your heater decide to have problems? I mean, not just one, but both of them. Yeah. You know, and she went, Ooh, that's kind of interesting. So in the meantime, I had to get off the phone because I had a, a client call coming up. And so I said, I'll call you back later. So I called her back later, and when I did, I had taken a shower, and, you know, wonderful things happen to me in the shower. It's, it's like a place of meditation. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. well, I'm busy shampooing my hair, my inner being flows in thoughts, right? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I get it. Sure <laughs> because I'm it. like, and I wasn't really even thinking about her situation, but all of a sudden I got an idea about the termite thing. So I texted her and I said, hey, if you can, call me. I want to tell you something. I just got about the termites. You're going to just, it's going to blow your mind. So she calls me up and I said, okay, so simultaneously you have your AC heating situation going out. That's hot and cold. And we know that that one's now representing your relationship where you were pulling back because you were blowing hot and cold in the relationship. And she goes, right. And I said, so I was thinking, how does this fit in with the termite thing? And all of a sudden, this is what came to me. You were putting up walls, which we had talked about earlier with, with the men in her life. She puts up walls, right. and it's time to take them down. And I said, the termites were taking down your wall. And she just stopped, paused, and burst into tears. Oh. And she said, that's it. That's it. And I said, look at the perfection of the signs and symbols sent to you by the universe. At the same time, you have an AC heating thing going hot and cold, which represents your relationships. And you have termites trying to tear down your wall. I said, because it's time for you to take down your walls and stop blowing hot and cold. And she went, that's it. That's so totally it. And then, it, like, for her, she's like, I know I can do things differently in my relationship because the stuff we talked about with the, the mother-her relationship thing, that shifted how she feels about who she is now in relationships. But I was just enamored by the p total perfection of those two circumstantial evidences or those two circumstantial situations that were both sending a strong message for her that it was time for her to get this hot and cold thing fixed and to tear down her walls and let love in and allow herself to let love out. No more walls. And so it will not surprise me at all if the termite situation is gone. I mean, she said she, on a physical level, she used some termite killer. And other people might go, oh, no, like I'm a termite expert. And once you have termite, it lasts forever. Oh, no, I don't believe that. I believe the universe has very specific 
ways of sending us messages as indicators of things that we need to bring to our attention. And once we do it, the indicator is gone. The indicator has no need to be persistent or hang on anymore. That, that's an interesting theory. And, and I think on some level I can buy into it, but I, I do have one question and th this is the one that would gnaw at me, which is, is that really the most direct communication that my inner being can give me? I mean, look what she had to go through in order to figure the darn thing out. Well, no, it's not the most direct. But things show up in our physical world like that when we've not addressed the negative feelings that we've had previously and or we didn't know what to do with them. So I can tell you in my friend's situation, for years, she's been feeling this hot and cold thing when it comes to love relationships. And she said she did it with her marriage on and off the whole time they were married. Mm. But she didn't know love of attraction. She didn't understand how her inner being tried to communicate with her. Um, and so she didn't know. She would just feel, I'm going to pull back because I don't feel loved. And so I'm not going to get my heart stepped on again. I'm just going to pull back. So she didn't recognize sure. when she was doing that, how that felt. It did feel uncomfortable to her, but she didn't know what to do with that uncomfortable feeling. Right. She didn't right. recognize back then that has always been a signal or a clue or a message that she was actually moving away from what she preferred because what she preferred was to feel loved. And when she didn't like the fact that for because of how she was making decisions and the meaning she was assessing, it didn't feel good. But she didn't know what to do with the, this doesn't feel good to me. And so our inner beings in the universe do whatever they can to get our attention. But if we don't know how to read the signs and signals, or if we don't know how to pay attention when things are at an emotional negative level, it will get bigger and it'll either get into our body and that's how we create dis-ease or it'll be a physical circumstance that causes us to do something like an air conditioner now requires attention or, um, um, or the termite situation happened. Now, most people who know nothing about law of attraction would say those things are just arbitrary and her heating and air conditioning unit just happened to have a problem. And well, termites are termites. They do their thing and they were just eating up her wall. Now, because I've been following law of attraction for over a decade now, I have come, I mean, I've been paying attention to these kinds of things, both in my life and in other people's lives. And I would say, at least 90% of the time, I'm able to get almost an immediate, like immediate could be within a day or a week, um, metaphoric understanding of what thoughts the person's been thinking or what thoughts I've been thinking that line up with this physical circumstance. And as soon as I take, up, take care of the thoughts and shift them, so now I go from thinking negative to now it has a more positive vibrational quality, then the physical circumstances either go away by themselves or I get them repaired and they stay repaired. Does that answer the question you had? I think it does. It, it, I mean, it's... I, I like directness, and so that's why I struggle with it. I mean, you, you, I think you adequately answered the question, but I, I still want to know why I can't be getting a more direct answer, why she couldn't get a more direct answer, more specifically in her case. What, why why is it that she came was, more direct? She was getting a more, more direct communication, but she wasn't tuned in to receive it. So you think it was there and she just didn't notice it? I believe our infinite being is broadcasting information and answers to us 24-7. Okay. It is a continual broadcast. Well, I can accept that. Just like you, yeah, just like you want our show eventually to be 24-7 where people can <laughs> tune into something that gives them their, a daily dose of happy right? Yep. whenever yep. they're ready for it. I believe our infinite being is doing that already. 
But it's just like, you know, like if you think of a, a scenario where a mother is trying to teach their child something to not get in trouble and the child's not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, and they yeah, end up getting yeah. in trouble anyway. Well, I, I, that's the part I can certainly identify with because, I mean, I've been aware for the last few years that I have not been aware before that. And so I've been really trying to learn how to get back in touch, so to speak. So that part I can get. You know, I, I can see how inner beings trying to send messages and I'm just not you – know, the, the receiver's just not turned on. That makes sense to me. Yeah. And see, most people, not only is their receiver not on – they don't realize they are a receiver. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to know that first. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, and I will, I mean, the truth is there are some people that know nothing about law of attraction and they are living incredibly blessed lives of ease. And, you know, we look at them and go, how dare they do that? And what are they doing? <laughs> are they drinking some special sauce that we don't know about? Is something in the water. I mean, and I what? think, yeah, it's like, I think by default when they were young, they started making associations that today you and I are having to make deliberately. But for them, they just sort of made some associations and it worked for them and they just kept doing it. It makes me think about what you've told me about your friend Keisha and her ability to see energy. And I, I'm wondering how many of us actually knew how to do that when we first came into the world and forgot about it. I think every, every one of us without question. I believe every one of us came in with all of our Claire um, modalities uh, activated, you know, Claire sentience, Claire cognizance, Claire audience, or whatever all those names are. I know there's five Claire's, but it's like we have metaphysical abilities to see things that are not physical, seeable objects. We can also hear things that are not physical hearing things and we can sense and we can taste and we can touch. And I believe we came into this world as little babies having all of those things intact. And then I believe because this world doesn't use those very much, they weren't reinforced. And instead we started to pay attention to how other people interpreted the physical signs and so as little physical babies, we started to pay more attention to what was in the physical because that's what the big people were doing. And there wasn't hardly anybody who was paying attention to the non-physical things. I mean, unless maybe you go, you know, a baby goes on a play date with a whole bunch of other babies, they might all have non-physical communication amongst themselves. Could be. You know. Movies been made about but, that. <laughs> but beyond that... I, I do believe most of us get trained away at a very early age um, to no longer use uh, the tools and the knowings that we had when we first came here. Mm. And so they're always available to us at any point in our adult life that we learn about them or get clued into them or are open on a spiritual channel to receive all of those channels are available to us. But I know for myself, as well as others I've worked with, even though those things are there and it, they can be easily activated, because they don't act like or or I don't we don't know enough people using them, we doubt that they're real. Yeah. So it's like how long do we question and second guess? Well, I think I'm getting this idea, but because I don't know the source of it, I don't want to call it valid. That's certainly where I've been at, yeah. And yet we are willing to call things valid that we go, well, I don't feel worthy, or I just have low self-esteem. Yeah, that, that's interesting, isn't it? We, we, we sell out on that kind of thing so easily. Yeah, that one's easy. Or, you know, well, you know, so-and-so is prettier than me, and, you know, that's the problem. It's because I'm not pretty enough. Or... Well, that person's more successful because, you know, they went to Yale or Harvard, you know, and I didn't go to school and I don't have the credentials. So, you know, therefore, it's easier for us to judge ourselves as less than. Oh, yeah. Because we compare ourselves to others. Right. And I mean, comparing ourselves to others, 
there is a benefit in that. That helps us sometimes measure our growth and, and determine how we want to move forward. But it also works against us, especially if we're looking at some of these non-physical tools that we have available to us. Because when we look around and go, I don't know anybody who who's using Claire Cognizance. I don't know anybody else who's using this Claire audience thing. Well, I and do know. I actually do know somebody who I, I know two somebodies who, in my own life, who are using some kind of energy, uh, reading okay. or just detecting in some way. That's my two cats. And the reason I know that is uh, we live in an apartment complex, and the apartment that we live in, there's like a little. Um, when you open the door, it's like a little. It's not an alley. It's like a little path that you have to walk about ten feet out before you actually get to see what's out there. So there's this it, there's this this little tunnel thing that they have to get through, and they're not really sure are there any predators around. You know, so they have to kind of sniff for them, or look for them, or feel for them. And I can see them sniff, and and if there's a sound, I, I see their ears turn toward the sound. But sometimes they react to something, and I don't know what they reacted to. I can't see anything. I can't hear anything. I can't sense anything. I don't know what they reacted to. But they reacted to something. And that's what makes me think they're reacting to some energy. Mm-hmm. And it kind of makes sense because, I mean, we've been told that uh, animals are great at receiving. They're not so good at being deliberate creators, but they're excellent at receiving. Whereas humans, we're great at being creators, but we're not so good at the receiving and allowing part. Animals are great at allowing. So it makes sense from that perspective. Right. Well, and we have all heard of situations where, like, dogs can hear sounds at vibrational sure. yeah, qualities also, that also the human stuff, ear yeah. can't hear. True. And because yeah. that has been measurable by science, we don't doubt that. And so, you know, they have dog whistles that you and I can't hear, but dogs hear very clearly. Mm-hmm. And see, we don't doubt that at all. And dogs don't doubt that they can hear that. They don't go, you stupid human, what's wrong with you? Open up your hearing and listen to the same sound we're we're hearing. It's like no big deal to them. Well, there are all sorts of um, broadcast signals, metaphysically speaking, that are within our uh, sphere of receiving. Okay. But, sorry, I'm just, I'm coughing, so I'm putting myself on mute a lot. Well, I'll, I'll give you a break then for a second, because I wanted to add in. Okay. The, uh, the, the the ability to transmit and to receive this information, you know, the, the, this extra sensory or whatever you want to call it, the, the, this other energy stuff, is, it, it, it's something that I think goes beyond ultrasonic, like, if if you if you blow an, a dog whistle, right, an ultras- ultrasonic whistle, a very very high pitched whistle that humans don't don't generally hear, I can't hear a tone, but I can feel it. I do feel it. Like if there's like a an ultrasonic humidifier in the room, I don't hear the ultrasonic uh, pitch, but I can feel it. I can feel the pressure of it on my ears. Mm-hmm. I don't feel anything when the cats are reacting to certain things. I don't, I have no sensory awareness of it all. So maybe it is an actual sense beyond my sensual range. That's quite possible. But mm-hmm. I I know that I also have enough sensitivity that I can at least you know feel to some degree other kinds of of wavelengths that are out there. And by by that I mean physical wavelengths, not spiritual wavelengths. So I guess there's well, there's a part of me that wonders: is there perhaps another form of energy, maybe like a source energy that they're actually tapping into? I mean, I honestly, this is kind of like in that gray area where it's not like I totally understand the science behind it. Um, But I know when I was working with my client today, I was saying something. And as I said it, I said, oh, I'm getting goosebumps right now. And I said, that has always been my sign for um, what I'm saying is in complete alignment to what our source energy, what the universe knows. And she went, oh, and she goes, and I would agree because that feels really right to me. Like it was really resonating with her. And then I kept talking. I said, okay, now I have full body chills. It went from like just my forearms and my hands. And I said, now this tingling sensation has moved up my body to my shoulders and Mm -hmm. down my legs. My whole body feels electrified. Mm -hmm. Now, that to me has always been a sign or a symbol 
for because I'm in alignment with my inner being that there is actually an electrical impulse that is like activated so strongly that my physical body actually senses it. Mm. What we call that, I don't know, but that to me is another way of learning or being feeling guided. Like when I say something and there's goosebumps, it's like that tells me I'm in residence, I'm in alignment with my my infinite being. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I mean, and I can't manufacture goosebumps. (laughs) I I suppose you can if you're really, you know, like if you're in a warm house and it's cold outside and you go outside and you for a while and you get goosebumps. But to me, those are those are physical goosebumps. Mm -hmm. Um, cause what I'm talking about is not where I have little bumps on my, on my skin. Yeah. You're talking about like, like the, the hair. The hairs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're talking about the hair sensations. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not because I have static electricity. Right, right. <laughs> and I don't know what make, I don't know the physicality of what makes that thing occur. I just know that it does. And it has always, whenever I follow the information that is being spoken while I get the hair standing on end, it has always worked out good for me. Mm. And it works out good for other people. And to me that yesterday we were talking about like just testing how you know when you're receiving information from your infinite being or from the universe, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, you got to test it and you know, you decide, okay, I'm going to believe this is a yes and go with it. And if you get a positive result, you go, okay, well then that must be what, the hair standing on end meant or what that good feeling meant, Mm -hmm. you know, but I love your question, which is, can't my infinite being speak to me more directly? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like a whole lot to ask. (laughs) Well, and I believe the answer is absolutely. And it's our job and responsibility to learn how to tune in with our receivers and learn those subtle differences between being right on the station to receive versus being in the static of, yeah, the station's not coming in clearly. Now, of course, really young kids wouldn't know what the heck we're talking about, but we know because you and I are of an age where, you know, we worked with radio dials. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And we knew what it was like. You could move a radio dial just an eighth of an inch and you got pure, clear, radio station you're like yes that's it and then somebody knocks it and it takes a while to tune back in Mm -hmm. to find that clear station yeah we had to use manual tuning turning a dial and it would slowly move its way up and down the the spectrum of wavelengths Yeah. yeah and to me when we went to the digital signals that to me i didn't like the digital signals as well Really? Because there were times my digital signal said I was at 98.7 and I was hearing static. And I wished I had a dial because I could tune in better. <laughs> but it really all is about us learning to tune in. And it's our responsibility to figure out what, what those signals mean by testing them out. But you know what? If someone doesn't care then they can just live their life in roller coaster style and live by default. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do that. It's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, nothing wrong with it. Um, I think those of us who are listening to this show, we have more of a sense of we want to be in control of our lives and have fun putting our hands in the clay and being a part of the creative manifestation and knowing that we can help to orchestrate what happens when it happens and how it happens. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even though, you know, we're still in partnership with the universe who sees the big picture and can help orchestrate things from a different vantage point, but it's our job to tune in. Absolutely. So, and I'm afraid I hope, we're gonna... I hope the stories that I shared, you know, help uh, both you, me, and others listening um, to know how to pay attention to what those signals might mean. I, I hope that's true. Unfortunately, we have to drop it right there because we're completely out of time. So, Wendy, it's been a pleasure. Let's do it again tomorrow. Okie doke. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now.